Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Please feel free to continue finishing your lunch as our panel takes the stage. Uh, we appreciate everybody coming and also uh, for dealing with our kind of new revised check-in procedures. We're trying to keep uh, everybody safe, our, our staff as well as uh, members and guests. So thank you for the extra time at checking in. And uh, obviously today's panel is extremely timely. Uh, we're going to be live streaming it on Facebook Live and we're going to be, uh, uh, will be it will live forever on, on video uh, on YouTube. Uh, we will have time for questions and answers afterwards. Uh, so uh, be thinking of your questions and when you, uh, when you make them, please make them in the form of a question. If you haven't already, please silence your uh, mobile devices. Uh, so today's topic is how to deal with the physical and mental challenges facing Hong Kong uh, amid the uh, coronavirus. And we're going to look at um, how, these, how the outbreak has brought back some painful memories of SARS, which crippled the city in 2003, but also how, um, how this is different, how uh, long we think this may continue to affect Hong Kong, and we'll discuss the impact of the virus on Hong Kong and its citizens, the lessons to be learned from SARS, the, and the coping mechanisms, uh, both mental and physical, for the city's residents. Uh, we are very, uh, very fortunate to have a uh, terrific panel today, all of them um, either medical professionals or people who have been dealing with the virus in various ways, and uh, thanks to our professional committee for putting this together in, in such, um, in such uh, quick order. Uh, we, I will introduce our panelists um, who will be moderated by Keith Richberg from the Journalism School at HKU and a member of our Board of Governors. Our panelists include uh, Kiju Fukuda, who is a director and clinical professor at the University of Hong Kong School of Public Health. He previously worked at the World Health Organization uh, as an assistant director general and special representative of the director general for antimicrobial resistance and has also um, worked uh, uh, in various other uh, capacities uh, in, in, the, um, uh, in WHO and elsewhere. Uh, we have with us Dr. Ersina Ma, who is the chairperson of the Hong Kong Public Doctors Association, which is the body of medical doctors working in the city's hospital authority, Department of Health, and medical facilities of all the universities in Hong Kong. Uh, we also have Elizabeth Chung, who's been a health reporter at the South China Morning Post since 2014, and has covered the coronavirus since the outbreak began. And then we also have Odile Thiang, who is an anti-stigma projects coordinator at Mind Hong Kong and an a child and adolescent teaching fellow at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, and her background is in emergency medicine, pa pediatric mental health, sexual assault, and domestic violence. I give you our panel, moderated by Keith Richberg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jody, for that kind introduction. And uh, my job as moderator is to get the discussion rolling with a couple of questions for each and then really turn to the audience so we can hear what you have to talk about. We're in great shape here because we have two doctors and one nurse. So we're, if anything happens, we are, you're safe and we have one journalist to record it all. So, <laughs> so ladies, with your permission, I'm going to skip all the way down to the end to talk to KG, not only because he's my colleague at HKU, but also because we met in the 1990s, 1997, uh, when the epidemic we were all talking about was bird flu uh, and I was here asking you questions at a press conference when you were here wearing another hat. So uh, KG, if you could put this into perspective for us now, we've now had two months or more that you've been looking at this virus, all of January, all of February, maybe even slightly before around Christmas time. Tell us, now, now having looked at this now for a couple months, you've got all this experience looking at SARS, looking at bird flu, MERS, what do we know about this virus? What don't you know about this virus that you wish you knew? What makes you optimistic about what you know? And what keeps you up at night? So, you know, you can tell why Keith has spent his life in journalism. It was a very polite introduction to tell me how old I am. <laughs> so anyways, I'm really delighted to be here. And Jody, thank you for the invitation and Keith. Um, the outbreak is, you know, for people who work on outbreaks, a really interesting mix of things that we've seen in the past and things that we haven't seen in the past. So to put it into perspective, in our lifetime, at least for the lifetime of, of some of us, you know, the big infectious diseases that we've seen come out have been things such as HIV AIDS back in the 1980s or 1970s, 1980s. We've seen various forms of 
um, avian influenza come out, and then a couple of different coronaviruses like the current one. So SARS um, back here in 2003 in, the, in, the, in this region, and then uh, the Middle East respiratory virus which emerged in Saudi Arabia. And uh, then of course we've had the episodes like Ebola and Zika virus and so on. So we've had a lot of experience with a variety of different outbreaks. And uh, in keeping with virtually all of them, or all of them, you know, this virus, again, is something which emerged in animals, got transformed, and became adapted to people. So this is how we see these new outbreaks occur. We know that this outbreak, um, or this virus, is transmissible from person to person. And we believe that mostly it's transmitted by a respiratory route, basically meaning that when you cough and you put out droplets or you put out some kind of vapor, you can infect other people, either directly or you get it on your hands or perhaps on the environment and so on. But this is largely how this virus goes from one person to another. So when we talk about person-to-person -person transmission, that's what we, what we mean. And we also know that this virus behaves a little bit like influenza so that uh, when a person is infected, they can begin to infect other people relatively early in their illness. This is different than what we saw with SARS. With SARS, you would get sick, but you would be pretty mild, and you were largely not that infectious. But when you got very sick and got hospitalized, that's when you began infecting other people more easily. And so we had big hospital outbreaks back then. Now, in terms of the large epidemiology, we know that this infection can infect people of all ages. But if you look at the information coming from China, the, the vast majority of people are somewhere in their middle ages, from about 30, 40, 50. That's the biggest group. But again, kids or older people can get infected. By contrast, it's pretty clear that the people who are most likely to develop serious illness and serious illness means people who are largely going to develop uh, difficulty breathing, perhaps end up on a respirator. These are older people. So older people being anywhere from 50, 60 and above. But once you get to the 80s, then your chances are maybe 15 times higher than someone younger to end up with serious illness. And these are the people most likely to die. But also people who have associated conditions like cardiovascular disease or, or hypertension and so on. So we're beginning to see a lot of information about the virus, about how it's transmitted. There's still a lot of details to be worked out. You know, we don't know whether uh, the virus can hang around in the air. We don't know whether fecal transmission is a big component of it and so on. But these kinds of things will begin to get worked out. What's interesting is that like all of these infections, we know that people can get on planes and take it to another country. So we've seen this, you know, there's 30 plus countries now that have reported cases. The big question is whether it's going to take in any of these countries in the same way that it has in Wuhan and Hubei. So in Wuhan and Hubei, no doubt that there's large amounts of community transmission going on with a lot of people getting sick, a lot of transmission in hospitals. And everywhere else, we're kind of looking and not sure whether that's going to take. But when you ask, what are we worried about? That is what we're worried about. You know, we can imagine this virus going to some very large cities with health systems which are not that good, in essence. And then we have an explosion. And this, is, this for most of us, is the biggest nightmare. And this is what we're looking for. So this is kind of where we are in terms of, I think, a lot of the big pieces of information. And just to follow up uh, with you, KG, when, in Hong Kong now, what are we looking at? The Education Bureau just said, okay, let's close everything until the week after Easter. Does that mean that when it gets a little bit hotter out, we're all in the clear? Do we see the light at the end of the tunnel here? Um, I hope so. But again, <laughs> let me put this in perspective. You know, in Hong Kong, I think as of today, there have been 85 cases reported. And this is over about a five and a half to six week period. And so, you know, if you just do a little bit of arithmetic, this averages out to about two people infected per day. I mean, the shape actually looks a little bit different, but it's around two people per day. If we were dealing with influenza, 
we wouldn't be counting two people or ten people or a hundred people. It would be a vastly different situation. So can we hope that things are under control? Well, my own take on it right now is that the control measures which have been put in place largely are having a big effect. I don't think that we would be talking about two cases per day if those kind of control measures were not taking place, simply because if we look north into the mainland, the numbers are so much larger. And we're, we're in a different situation than that. So yes, I think there's reason to think that we can um, not get rid of the infection overnight, but that we can keep the numbers minimal, which I think is a good thing to aim for. Great. We'll come back to you, but let's, uh, let's start here, and then we'll go down the line. Dr. Ma, uh, representing the public doctors, are you now a little bit more optimistic that everybody in Hong Kong is ready to deal with this, or does something keep you up at night? Um, actually, um, I'm an internal physician, and I'm working in one of the regional hospital with emergency service. Uh, in Hong Kong, actually, because uh, confirmed cases are situated in different districts, so every uh, emergency hospital needs to take care of some of those confirmed cases. In my hospital, we have 10 confirmed cases. Some have been uh, transferred to the Princess Margaret Hospital. One of them, uh, one of them may uh, be discharged soon. We have a summary meeting just yesterday. Actually, um, I'm a physician that uh, started my career in the SARS period. Um, SARS, uh, so this uh, epidemic uh, make us really worry at the beginning. Will it be another episode of SARS with 10% of uh, mortality and no definite efficient treatment? However, um, maybe almost a month time since we have the, uh, the disease in Hong Kong, the conditions uh, actually uh, comfort us a bit. First of all, uh, now we know that this disease, there are some drugs may be quite effective in treating it, especially when you start it early. Uh, the HIV uh, drugs, the Kalitra, actually um, we have 10 patients, um, or, or more, around 80 patients in Hong Kong. Uh, most of them get start the treatment. Some of them start early, some of them start later, but most of them have quite good uh, results. And uh, generally around the world, maybe for this disease, the mortality uh, is just one to two percent, and mainly is limited to those uh, elderly and also those with chronic disease. But uh, unlike SARS, actually many young, uh, good past health uh, adults really died of it, but not for this disease. And other things um, that uh, make us uh, comfort us a bit is um, the chance for it to spread to our healthcare personnel is uh, actually is less than SARS. Uh, maybe um, maybe uh, Dr. Uh, Kenji can uh, supplement it a bit. For this disease, uh, the most infective period is the first few days when you get infected. So actually it's the time you are in the community. But uh, for SARS, actually your most infective period is around the eight day, 10 days. It's a time when you're inside the hospital, you are very sick, you need to be intubated with a lot of medical procedures. That's why during the SARS period, we have very high, uh, many, um, quite large number of healthcare personnel get infected. Uh, in my hospital, we have um, few uh, healthcare personnel died of the SARS when they're working. But till now, there's no uh, medical health uh, personnel in Hong Kong has been infected yet. Although uh, the numbers in mainland has worried us a bit, but we have analyzed their practice. Seems that their infectious control measures are not as effective as us. So, um, Though there are still uh, quite a lot of tensions in our healthcare system, for example, um, uh, um, our conflict with the government, the strike, uh, the lack of protective material, the high uh, hospital bed occupancy, and so on. But um, I, I need to admit that um, I, I am comforted a bit um, at the uh, right at this point uh, compared to the uh, early February. And just to, if you can keep the mic one second, let me just ask, do you have, do you and the doctors have everything that you need? Or what would you, what's on your wish list? Um, of course, we don't have everything we need. We're still fighting for it. Um, um, although um, we are uh, sort of surprised for some protective equipment, but I think this situation is all over the world. Even the Americans say that um, China, uh, doesn't allow uh, the 3M company to export those uh, respirator masks back to 
USA. Same for us. Uh, but at this moment, we still have enough medical supply uh, for those working with the uh, confirmed case. Those uh, medical personnel who are at most in need of this equipment. But for someone who are working in a low risk area or moderate risk area, we may limit our use uh, to save all those equipment for those working in a dangerous area. Can I just ask you a small question? If someone goes to their private doctor and they say, look, I've got a cough and a bit of a fever, what does that private doctor do? Um, actually, my husband is a general practitioner working in the private market. Uh, different, uh, different, practice, uh, different places have different practice. I know that for most of the um, private hospital, if you are coming back from those uh, country with high numbers of infected cases, for example, in mainland or maybe today is Korea or Japan, they tell them your travel history, you tell them you have some um, sign, uh, symptoms of chest infection and you got fever. They will ask you go straight to the emergency room of public hospital. Um, because first of all, they don't have all kinds of protective equipment. Secondly, they may not have the test to confirm it. Uh, actually, the uh, test, there's another thing make us the situation better than SARS. We have developed the test kits. Actually, it's just, uh, it's very sensitive accurate and it just take out a few hours to confirm it. For our hospital, uh, we will take a uh, few turns of test every day. We can release the result within uh, four, three to four hours. Uh, for confirmed case, we need to take one more test in the uh, laboratory of Department of Health. It just take you maybe half day's time. But maybe for private uh, practitioner, they may not uh, have the right to assess to those kinds of tests. So that's why they will ask you to go to the public hospital. Okay, thank you. We'll get back. Um Elizabeth, I know you were asking earlier by email, why do we have a journalist on this panel with these esteemed medical practitioners here? The reason is specifically, you know, I pick up my SCMP to figure out what the heck is going on here. There's so much conflicting news and information going on. It's being tamed in China. No, it's not really being tamed in China. We're close to a vaccine. No, we're years away from a vaccine. There must be 200,000 cases. No, we think it's tapering up. How do you as a journalist put this all in perspective? Who do you believe? What do you discount? Well, I think first of all, we have to um, understand that this virus is a new virus. So, I mean, for scientists, for health authorities, they're exploring um, information about this um, virus every day. So there may be some new information coming day by day. So, I mean, we have to first of all acknowledge this fact first. And, and when it comes to what kind of information that should be reliable, I, I mean, it often sticks to the golden rules of journalism, like reliable source. You often go to the government or you make a call to Dr. Ma to, to check yeah, whether those information is true or not. Call experts. Um, I think that's what I often do when it comes to information. Um, I mean, even from official um, sources, those information could, could be conflicting. Because when we see that example in vaccine development, okay, so uh, in Hong Kong, you, Professor Yun Kuo Yong said, okay, we have a vaccine that might be appear maybe in a year or so later, but then in China, they have something that will maybe be ready next month or so later. I mean, we have to put in all these um, information into context and to let uh, readers to understand that because of this um, this virus is new, and therefore, I mean, it's understandable that there may be information from different perspectives. I mean, the most important point is you go to experts uh, for information. And uh, talk to us about how the government information flow has been uh, compared to the protests or other things we've seen. Are you getting all the information? Are you and the other journalists getting what you need, or are you pulling teeth? Um, I would say that actually the government has done efforts to improve its communication. We could see that, I mean, since the first cases were confirmed on 23rd of January, the government has been holding um, daily press conference at 4.30 p.m. and also they have set up this interactive map on the Center of Health Protection website. So I could see that um, this kind of efforts. But then um, because of the complexity and um, the multiple parties that this epidemics involved. I mean, only having health authorities coming out to give out the information is not enough. For example, uh, when we're dealing with um, Hong Kong passengers on the uh, Diamond Princess cruise, those information are actually followed by the security bureau. And so when we go to the daily um, presser by the health authorities, actually 
they were not able to tell us a lot of updates about those people. When one to follow up Hong Kongers who were stuck in Hubei province, what is the latest health condition? What is the government going to do? They were followed up by the Constitutional and Mainland Affairs Bureau. So I mean, this, okay, I could see the government is doing its efforts to release information, but maybe it's not enough. When it comes to information that is involved by other departments, then maybe we could just passively sit and wait for press statements at 10 or 11 p.m. when we're already maybe past our deadline, something like that. So I mean, I could see the improvement, but maybe there could still room of yeah, more to be done. Okay, great answer. We'll get back to you too. And Nurse Chiang, Franklin Roosevelt said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. But is Hong Kong afraid right now? And are we too afraid? And how is that affecting our society? Um, first of all, thank you for having us um, up here. Um, are we too afraid? I think there is quite a lot of anxiety, um, particularly sort of around the panic. Um, this is an unknown. We don't know what we're dealing with, um, and information is coming to us sort of day by day. Um, and that's very anxiety provoking, as well as the fact that there is no real timeline to this. You were asking, you know, when it heats up, are we going to be done with this? But we really don't know. So that's a very big source of anxiety for people. And then on top of that, you have a change in the way we work. So a lot of us are working from home. Um, some of us are parents, and if we're parents, we're trying to figure out how to work from home, as well as how to be newly um, minted teachers at home, um, and dealing with that. And I think the added um, sort of anxiety and stress for people in Hong Kong has been family separations as well. So some families um, are either separated, we can't, they cannot come back to Hong Kong. Um, some families have separated because this all kind of came to came to a boil sort of in, around the Chinese New Year holidays, so some have stayed where they were. Um, so there was just kind of mounting pressures for everyone, and I think the fact that social media doesn't make it that much easier for us, so we're getting a lot of information um, and sifting through a lot, whether it's true or false, and I think that's what's generating quite a lot of anxiety. And we just, we came up on this virus emergency just after having six months of protest and watching live stream of protest on Now TV, and that was already causing, I think, a level of PTSD among Hong Kongers. Are, are you seeing this now just kind of as a piling on, or, or what, what are you seeing? What effects in the community? Yes, yeah, so there have been a few studies that were kind of done af around the time of the um, protests as well as sort of now. And what we have seen sort of collectively from all these studies is that um, during the protests, people were feeling the effects of the protests and were um, feeling the trauma of the protests or having sort of... Um, symptoms of trauma from the protests. And then now we're seeing that the people are having a lot of anxiety. Um, so I think Hong Kong has gone through a really difficult year. Um, I myself, I lecture at Hong Kong Poly U. This has been a heck of an academic year for us um, and for all the students out there. So this has been sort of a, another pile up for Hong Kongers, I think, which is different from globally from what everybody else is feeling. Um, and to layer on top of that, all of the trauma that comes with, um, having, gone with uh, having gone through SARS. Um, so, you know, the panic buying, a lot of that, I had no idea that I was supposed to buy toilet paper, but a lot of that came from sort of historical knowledge of saying, people saying, that's the first thing that went away, you know, during SARS. So there is a lot, a lot of compiled trauma for, for Hong Kongers. If you compare this to the normal flu, more people, far more people get the flu than get this virus, correct? So is this, do you think this fear is exaggerated or do you think there's a real reason for it? I think the fear of the unknown, I think that the unknown component of it is what's amplifying it. Um, I think now living in social media time, um, that amplifies it. Um, I, I do think that some of the media coverage um, that has been a little bit sensationalized um, has contributed to all of this. Um, 
but yeah, you're right. You know, the flu has hit and it has hit pretty hard. Um, so I kind of looked at some of the statistics and in the week of February 10th, um, we've had about 13 deaths um, attributed to influenza. Um, and the week before that, it was 18. So we have to really put things into perspective. Yeah, keep it in perspective. And before I get to your questions, and please start thinking of your questions, just one last one. If anyone wants to take this, KJ, I'll, I'm looking at you, but anyone. Do you see an end to this? And when should we be looking at this to be kind of a return to normalcy in Hong Kong? When I was a medical student, a surgeon said, well, bleeding always stops at some point. No, of, of course the outbreak will end, you know. The outbreak will end, and I think that there's two probably key things to look, look out for. You know, it's, I think the end doesn't mean that we have zero infections. You know, whether this virus becomes something which becomes endemic so that we have it on a more constant basis is a real possibility. We simply don't know. But I think that what we're all trying to get back to is a sense of normality and that we're not in the midst of a crisis. And so, yes, this will definitely come about. I think the key things that we need to look out for is, do the trends in mainland China really continue in the direction that they're being reported? If that comes under control, that's a big plus. And then we are looking at other countries like Iran and Italy and South Korea and Japan. And if these countries also bring it under control, and we don't see a, a large eruption in uh, some of the larger and poorer countries, then I think you're going to see a, a global sense as well as a sense in Hong Kong. So, Anyone else want to look into the crystal ball? When will we return to normalcy? I think, to be honest, um, I don't know what everybody else is feeling in the room. I think people have started to slowly um, get into normalcy, kind of seeing the numbers that they have been somewhat steady in Hong Kong and um, and I do feel like you know Central is getting filled up a little bit more people are out and about um, hiking a little bit more um, so I think people are starting to relax a little bit and there's toilet paper I saw toilet paper today we have toilet paper at the FCC if anyone's interested please don't take it anyone else want to make a crystal ball prediction or shall we please um, actually, I think uh, whether we do go back to normal, but there is an urge or desire in our heart want to get back to normal, and someone try to get back to normal. But as a doctor, I really want to know whether when we get back to normal, whether the uh, epidemic will go worse again. Um, as a mom, I really want my kids to go back to school. It's really painful to have home learning. <laughs> so, for you or for them? Uh, for me, because I just don't want to do the computer job after work. But um, yes, but we do worry. Uh, one of the reasons, I guess, why the government don't want the kids to go back to school is are the school able to provide masks for them? Are the parents going to provide masks for them? You just can't force your kids to do, use one surgical mask per day. They just keep throwing away their surgical mask. So many, many reasons why we can't go back to normal. Maybe not just because of the disease, because of the administration, resources, and so on. But yes, there is a strong desire to get back to normal. Same as the medical healthcare system, because uh, we have for this month, we have stopped many normal medical services. Uh, for the cardiac intervention, we stop it. For the surgery, we stop it. For the clinic, we stop it. We just stop um, every uh, non-infected patient going to the, go to the hospital. But actually, we need to go on. Okay. And Elizabeth, I know journalists don't like to predict. So you're going to stay away from that one, or are you going to make a prediction? I, I dare not to make any predictions among all the experts here, but I mean, same for journalists, we do hope for things going back to normal because of the coronavirus, other kinds of news have kind of been suspended, other kinds of press conferences, and even for, if you might have noticed, our newspaper actually have kind of changed a layout because of the coronavirus as well. So, I mean, for Hong Kong society, there is lots of other things happening that are equally newsworthy as well. It's not only coronavirus, there are other healthcare topics that are equally important. So I think it will be good when we see that this whole epidemic would come to, would quite be quiet a bit, yeah. Oddly, back to normal here means back to the protests. 
<laughs> We're going to take some questions here. Uh, please put your hand up, say who you are. I saw the first hand in the corner from Gavin, and please put your hand up, especially if you're on the veranda, because I can't see you well. So Thank you, one. everyone. Gavin McDougall. I'm from the Australian Consulate General. I'm not sure if KG or Dr. Ma are best to answer this. It's a two-pronged question, uh, but on the first one, we see um, suspected cases, confirmed cases, confirmed deaths. What there seems to be less information around is severity of the illness, treatment, and certainly about recovery rates. Uh, you mentioned briefly about the, the use of ARVs uh, in treatment. Can you comment on recovery rates or recovery and, and what that tells us about this, um, this present disease? Um, secondly, I could be wrong, but I understand that there are no vaccines for any of the coronaviruses that we currently know. What makes us think that it might be possible to create one for this coronavirus? Good questions. Maybe I talk about the recovery and live the vaccine for the for our Professor Kenji. Um, of course, it's too early to talk about re total recovery because uh, we just one month's time. Uh, but uh, from our experience for those ex discharged patients, actually um, not many of them with some uh, chronic uh, lung damages. Most of them, if they can uh, recover, they recover in quite a good shape. Uh, maybe because those recovered, usually they are in a young adult age, they have good health. Uh, for this uh, virus infection, actually for even for the quite asymptomatic, that means those with very mild disease, you will, uh, all of them you can find the uh, chest x-ray changes when you take the chest x-ray. That means there is some kind of damage or inflammation going uh, over the lung. But however, they don't have um, a very um, uh, long-term damage. Um, the patient actually, when they recover, they're quite in a good shape. Maybe because we have, we have some drugs to treat, we treat them with the Galitra or Rivalry and so on. So, um, but um, for those, um, for uh, one, we have two more uh, dead cases in Hong Kong. One of them, uh, both, both cases are still waiting for the uh, coroner report, the, exactly the cause of death. But uh, one of them, we uh, believe that is a multi-organ failure. That means uh, different important organs in the, uh, inside the body get uh, damaged with the uh, viral infections, or also your own immune response. And the other one, that 39 years old gentleman, we still puzzle about his cause of death. Um, but um, likely maybe because of a, a certain kinds of uh, inflammation over the heart, the myocarditis. But uh, the definite cause of death is we still need to wait for the um, coroner report to come out. But at this stage, um, I'm quite optimistic about those recovered. Seems that they don't have a long-term side effect of the infection at this stage. Great. Uh, do you, KG, you want to add something to that? Well, I'll maybe address the vaccine part of it. So in terms of vaccines, um, we, we will understand the immune response to the virus better. And that will give us the biological basis of whether a vaccine can really work, but it should work. The difference between the other two viruses, remember when SARS appeared, it appeared in 2003, I forget, March, April, something like that. And within several months, it was gone. And the incentive for making a, a SARS vaccine disappeared, the financial incentive for it. Same thing with the Middle East respiratory virus. This emerged about 2012, 2013. And it's been there in kind of, uh, you know, middling numbers, but it hasn't been, there hasn't been a huge incentive to go ahead to the actual development and production of a vaccine. I think this is different. The numbers of cases are much larger. And if we continue to see this virus circulate, I think that um, you know, there certainly are a number of different groups in several countries working on vaccine right now. So I think that you need both the biology and the finances and economic incentives to align to develop a vaccine, basically. Good questions. Uh, on the veranda there? Thank you. Uh, Robert Greaves from Hamilton Advisors and the American Chamber of Commerce. I want to pick up on what KG is saying, and this is a question, I guess, for you, KG, and Dr. Ma. It seems that after every one of these episodes of viruses breaking out, like every six years or so, we get to a point where we just say, let's go back to normal and that's it. But in fact, it takes, as I understand, 12 to 18 months to begin to develop a usable vaccine. 
So in an age of global travel, where we're having more and more repetition of these viruses, shouldn't we go to some sort of semi-permanent system where we don't forget the lessons of the last outbreak and keep developing drugs? And, and how, do, how would we organize ourselves around that? Thank you. Good question. Who, who wants to start? KG, you, you're leaning forward. Sh sure. I <laughs> The single biggest weakness and vulnerability that we have shown over the past several decades is exactly what you said. We go through this cycle where we see an outbreak occur. There's a huge amount of panic and attention. And by the end of it, everybody is so sick of it and tired of it, people just walk away. Organizations walk away. Individuals walk away. And even in places like the World Health Assembly, which really should be the basis of continuity, it, it can evaporate. And it's a, it's a strange human phenomenon. I mean, the 1918 pandemic, in essence, disappeared from human memory for several decades until it got resurrected by historians. And we are missing the most important point about going through this over and over again. It's in the period between outbreaks where we have the time and the machinery to actually do the things which ought to be done. You know, the biggest vulnerability we have from these outbreaks is not the biology, it's not the virus, it's that we don't um, take the time to strengthen health systems. We, we know what needs to be in place, but we are relying upon things like political will, we're relying upon things which may be there or not be there to get us to expend the resources to do it. It's basically money and then activity being done by the right people. And we miss that over and over again. So I would love for this outbreak to lead to that discussion about how does the um, attention move away from being political attention to becoming uh, having the, I think, the scientific, the public health, the many systems involved, and it's not just public health, it's agriculture, all these different systems getting enough attention so, the, so they're built up. But the problem is, is that as soon as this goes down, we will get back to the other world, there will be other crises which come up, and attention will wander, and this is what we've never been able to solve and get away from. Additional point? Um, I think the, maybe we look at the real uh, viral epidemic, uh, first of all, it starts in those uh, low-income or uh, less uh, well-developed country, and it is closely related to a uh, 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 living environment or contact with animal, which is quite rare in a developed country in America or in Hong Kong. And then, although this is start in the low-income country or uh, um, a, a country that with uh, less uh, 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 structural uh, medical health care system, and then they spread all over the world, they spread to the rich country, and then the economic turned down, and so on. So I think um, if we want to stop all those kinds of epidemic or pandemic goes on again, maybe the big country, the World Health Organization, so start to uh, work uh, help to those countries a bit more to try to um, stop um, all those kinds of epidemics come up again. And also, um, maybe the attention is also important. Uh, if without the epidemic, for medical uh, profession, usually we pay attention to the um, um, cancer, to the cardiovascular disease, to the obesity. Um, you don't have, the government won't pay you a lot on the infectious disease. Um, won't pay you a lot for the infectious control. I think uh, Hong Kong, actually our condition is a bit better because we are being attacked so frequently. We have SARS, the swine flu and everything. So actually um, the government or the hospital authority has put uh, constantly quite a number of uh, in enough money into the infectious control. So that's why we don't uh, fall down in a very bad shape. But I know that in some country, what they invest in the infectious control, infectious disease is not uh, that much. A uh, question here. You had your hand up, gentlemen. Uh, Nigel Sharman, Hogan Levels. Um, the UK is reportedly considering mass testing um, to discover the true spread of the outbreak in communities. Is that something that could be considered here, or would that ask a question you might know what the answer to? Is mass testing something that we would want here, a possibility? Well, there are studies which we should do. 
I mean, basically, when we're trying to figure out how many people have been infected, typically we do something called serology studies or sero surveys to look for the number of people who have antibodies against whatever infectious agent is out there. And the reason why this is important, it tells us, you know, in essence, what is the real scope of the outbreak? And it also begins, us, begins to give us a sense of, do we have a sizable number who are probably protected against the virus, which in the end protects everybody else? So by testing, it's not doing the kind of virologic testing that is being done to diagnose patients. It's really a different kind of a study, but it, it, it does make sense at some point. And uh, you had your hand up over here, Mr. Michelson. Uh, Mark Michelson, I'm A Asia. Thanks to all the panel. Very interesting discussion. Maybe even I feel a little bit better now. Anyway, uh, want to ask Dr. Fukuda, you mentioned earlier on that you thought Hong Kong's uh, handling of the, of the crisis at this point has been relatively good and it, it perhaps helped keep down the number of infections. It was already raised. There was a little problem elsewhere in Asia, especially in Japan and also in Korea. And in Japan, it, it involved largely a, a cruise ship, the Diamond Princess, as mentioned before. We had one here, too, that also was infected. Was there something that we were doing and are likely to do better than, than other places in terms of handling this, or are they, is it apples and oranges? Because, and you know, one of, the, one of the concerns is a lot of us travel a lot, and so we're concerned about this happening in Asia. So just, I don't want you to get involved politically, but just in terms of your, your own feeling about what's happening, and others if they want to comment too. Sure, well, one of the things which distinguishes countries is whether they go through something like this and then do make changes afterwards. So having worked in Hong Kong since the 1970s when I met Keith here, um, I have seen over time the Hong Kong government has taken steps, worked with health authority, worked with the physicians community to really strengthen the fundamentals. And so if you have fever, how you're handled, the, the beds with respirators, uh, just in the culture, the knowledge that outbreaks can occur. It's really pretty good here, and it's um, different in many other countries. China is another example. After SARS, in essence, they made a decision that they weren't going to be so embarrassed by something like that happening again. So they really strengthened their health systems. In other countries in Asia, it's a lot more variable. Um, and so in, uh, you know, in, there was the large outbreak of MERS which happened in Seoul a few years ago. And in what that outbreak showed was that in South Korea you have really strong technical services. You know, the laboratories are really good, but they were caught by surprise. And a lot of the things which they um, might have had in place a little bit better, they didn't have in place. But because the basic systems were there, and we're pretty strong, they're able to adapt to the situation. And I think that for Japan, it's probably a similar situation. I mean, clearly the Diamond Princess caught them by surprise. There are perhaps some unavoidable elements, and then there are some things which they probably could do much better. You know, they're gonna have to go back and assess and, and look at that situation. So these countries which have pretty strong fundamentals, I'm not, that worried about because they can adapt and come around. But there are other countries where the fundamentals are not very strong. You know, they don't have very many health workers, they don't have a culture of moving information along quickly or acting upon it. And so it really is almost a country by country difference that you would have to look at. And forgive me if you've had your hands up, I, we've only got a little bit, well, another minute, and I have to take at least one question from a female, and she's had her hand up over here. So. Thank you very much, Keith. I'm Mindy Taliente from Wellness for Life, and I just have a question, mainly for Mind HK. I can't see you, sorry, but I'm looking at you from the screen. <laughs> um, and actually, I'd love to hear the opinion from the other panelists um, in the medical field. Um, as someone under normal circumstances who would consider myself a mindfulness, wellness, and 
resilience expert. I'm going stir crazy trying to homeschool my three kids. I'll probably end up murdering before Easter. But it's, it's been really tough. And trying to look at this from a perspective of mental health and how it's impacting students, parents, and people in confined spaces who are working from home with the stress of all this happening. I know we're very rightly so focused on the physicalities of this virus at the moment, but is the government addressing anything to do with the mental health and the issues, the implications that it's having on everybody in Hong Kong right now? I think it was two million people were suffering from PTSD after the protests alone. And with this on top of it, I'm just, I mean, we're all building resilience right now, but is anybody in the government actually doing anything to address that? Or are we just going to get bored of it, walk away, and wait for the next thing to happen? Good question. Um, so I can't comment about what the government is doing. I know um, earlier, uh, or sort of later on during the year, there was a call for quite a bit of research around mental health. Um, so there is that. Um, and somebody else can comment on sort of what else is going on. But I can say that quite a lot of uh, NGOs around Hong Kong have really stepped up. Um, I'm going to do a, a little bit of self-promotion. I know for us, for MIND, we've come, to come up with um, resources um, around strategies for coping and um, and how to help yourself. Um, and we've done that um, bilingually. And I know CMHA as well, the City Mental Health Alliance, and there are a few other organizations around um, Hong Kong that have, have really stepped up. So there has been a stepping up from the community, which is really nice to see. Um, about the mental health support from the government, um, I think at this stage, you can say there is nothing going on. First, there's a few reasons. First of all, they put most of the resources to uh, try to contain the infected one, find out the infected one, and treat the infected one. On the other hand, uh, we also try to uh, cut out all sorts of unnecessary gathering or uh, hands-on and so on. So, um, but it's lucky that we don't have a um, large number of uh, dead patients. So. We do have their fear and anxiety, but we are not that desperate. Uh, about the PTSD um, during the protests, uh, since, um, the reason I know that um, several um, uh, university um, the academics try to do the study. Uh, as a public doctor association, we have discussed with the health bureau. Uh, uh, they should, um, because some of our colleagues working in the Department of Health, they are working with adolescent uh, uh, mental health issues. They do have more and more numbers of kids, uh, especially the, um, the, the secondary school kids, uh, seek for their help. Uh, we ask them to give us more resources, uh, support our staff better, uh, but it seems that this is a bit sensitive issue because um, most of the um, young adults with PTSD are the protester. They have been arrested and so on. So this issue has a certain kind of political agenda there. And, uh, Food and Health Bureau uh, handle it uh, in a very sensitive, um, sen uh, in a very careful uh, fashion. They just don't want to um, uh, give the, um, uh, um, the, 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 the um, some people think that they are overprotected to the protester or the youngster. My apologies, we're already a few minutes after the two o'clock hour and I know many of you have to get back to your home offices or get back to homeschooling your children. So this will end the formal part of our program. I know at least one or two of our panelists need to leave exactly now, but a couple should be sticking around. So if you had your hand up, um, if they might be able to ask them a question or two here or downstairs at the bar afterwards. But we're gonna wrap up here by saying thank you to Dr. Ma for taking a few, few minutes off from your busy schedule. Um, Elizabeth Chong for coming in. Odil, thank you for keeping us sane. And KG, thank you for keeping us safe. Um, we do want to just say thank you for the, from the audience, and we do have a little FCC gift bag for you. I don't know if it includes masks and toilet paper, but it will be something you can take with you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming.